Well, good morning. Welcome to Duncan Road Church, and welcome to folks who are joining us online. We're really glad you could be with us. I think it was Donald Barnhouse, the American preacher, who stood up and shocked his congregation by declaring, prayer changes nothing. Well, one old person almost dropped the hymn book, and one or two folks coughed and splitted. What do you mean, prayer changes nothing? We've been told all our lives, prayer changes things. And then he went on to explain, it's not prayer. It is God who answers prayer that brings the change. And prayer is one of the themes, prayer and sharing, that we're looking at this morning. I came across this little poem called Moments. Very simple, but it's good to remember. Happy moments, praise God. Difficult moments, seek God. Quiet moments, worship God. Painful moments, trust God. And every moment, thank God. Happy God. Seek God. Quiet moment. God. Painful moment. God. Moment. God. Our first. Now listen to the change. As so let's find our heart. God to praise Him. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his hope Oh, my 
Years ago, I remember picking Jackie up from uh, uh, top of Beacon Heights. There, Jackie was one of our senior members at the time. And as we were walking out of a house to the car, one of these little chaps ran up and said, "Gordon, Gordon, uh, where are you going?" I said, "Oh, we're going to church." And then this little urchin said, uh, "Oh, what'd you go there for?" <laughs> and it's one of those moments where you try to get someone in the car or whatever, and you you think that a, a simple answer. Uh, 10,000 reasons that song reminds us I, I could have gave him because God is good and we're there to enjoy him. God is loving. God is, I, I wonder if we went round with the roaming mic this morning. How many times we go round the room before we ran out of answers? I hope we get a few hundred. Whether we get 10,000, I don't know. But I think when we get to heaven, one day we'll have 10,000 and more when our minds are expanded and we realize what a great God we worship. Let's link our hearts together in prayer, shall we? Lord, forgive us for the times we think we're doing you a favor by being here or by reading your word or by praying or by witnessing. Thank you that you are the God who always does us the favor. And as we come into the presence of a God who made us, remind us again, Lord, that we should be grateful for the very air we breathe. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of another day. Thank you, Lord, that we can enjoy food and water and homes and the comforts of life. Um, we know that so many people are denied just these basic qualities this day. But Lord, thank you that we are enjoying them in abundance. We pray for those less fortunate than ourselves, especially for India. We've been asked to pray for India this month by one or two Christian organizations as uh, medication is scarce, as oxygen is scarce, as COVID continues to have a, a wicked grip on that nation, and therefore food is scarce and water is scarce as well. And Lord, we pray especially for those who are bringing aid and relief, may it get to the people who need it the most. And we pray, Lord, that other governments uh, might have uh, compassion and a desire to help uh, financially or by sending medication that they're not using. So we pray for India. There are so many countries like it. We think of uh, those uh, nations that have been hit by earthquakes recently. And, um, and there are so many places where civil war is going on and people can't even sleep peacefully at night. Lord, our heart breaks. Your heart must break. But we pray for your people in those situations that uh, no matter how dark it is, help them to shine as lights and give people a hope and a reason for living. Thank you, Lord, that we've been able to sing this morning of your goodness. Thank you that we've been able to remind our hearts that you are so patient with us. We deserve, Lord, a, a spiritual clip round the ear, I guess. But you're a God who forgives and forgets when we humbly come in repentance to you. Thank you, Lord, that you uh, desire to be close to us day by day. Forgive us again for the times we are so self-sufficient and we just get on and do things our way. Help us, Lord, even as a result of being here this morning, to leave this place walking with you, enjoying your company, experiencing your, the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, enabling us to serve you and lift you this week. So, Lord, hear our prayers and bless this time together, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. You may not know, but today it is National Thank You Day. Now, I don't know who comes up with these ideas, but I like this one because it gives me a nice lead into our communion time. And uh, I just Googled the word thank you, and this is the, what I learnt. The word or the term thank actually derives from the Latin term 
Tonga. Tonga. In essence, it simply means, I will remember. And that's what thank you is. I will remember what you have done for me. And so you respond in gratitude. So today is National Thank You Day. So, you know, just feel free to say thank you whenever you want to anyone who does something for you. All right. But I thought we might try the word thank you around the world. And especially for the little ones, I'm going to put up a, a thank you on the, the screen. There will be a flag to help you. Can you tell me what country they would say thank you? Now, that's an easy one. See, you've got the Union Jack for Great Britain. Thank you in English. So there'll be a different flag and the word thank you in a different language. Okay, I will attempt to pronounce it correctly using my multi-language skills. Google Translate, eat your heart out. Little ones first. Here's the first one. Ah, gracias, gracias. Where might you hear the word gracias? Which means thank you. Joe, Spain, spot on, one out of one. I'm almost impressed, one out of one, gracias. How about this one? Oh, she, 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 she. <laughs> David, how is it? There you go, there's a man who's been to China. Oh, <laughs> anyone going to guess? What do you reckon? Come on, Scott, this is one for you now. China, well done. That means, hey, next time you have your Chinese takeaway, you can now say thank you to them in their own uh, particular... That's Mandarin, actually, Mandarin. How about this one? Marseille. Marseille. Oh, uh, I forgot his name. I can... Not... Uh, Boaz. Do you think it's French? So does your mother. Well done there. Spot on. <laughs> Marseille is French. All right, so next time you have your frog's legs, you know what to say. Merci. All right, how about this one? Oh, shoe cram lucum. Shoe cram lucum. That's how I would say it. If you want to just read the bit underneath, no problem. You'll get it slightly better. Anyone know what language that one is? It's not so much a country, because it's spoken in lots of countries. Daniel, it is Arabic. Well done, and that's an Arabic flag. So if you meet someone who comes from a, often a Muslim background, they will know a little bit of Arabic. You can thank them. Don't know what for. They might not deserve it. How about this one? Oh, obrigado. Obrigado. This is one of my favorite ones. Obrigado. Use this a lot. Oh, who's it going to be? Stuart, Portugal, or even Brazil. And uh, if you're female, you respond obrigado. Ah. But uh, we men, we say obrigado. How about this one? This is my favorite of them all. Spicy bar. Spicy bar. And you couldn't get it better for this particular nation, could you? Spicy bar. Uh, go on in, Daniel. Russia. Russia. And there's no... Uh, um, what's the word? Um, not, not, not association, what's the word? We say typecasting or person casting with the word spy for Russia there. <laughs> Spicy bar. Okay, National Thank You Day. Okay, National Thank You Day. I think there are three things we can be thankful for today. First of all, for answered prayers. That's what we're looking at in our passage in Acts chapter 4. In our service, and you guys will be looking at it upstairs. God hears our prayers. He always answers them. Trouble is, he doesn't answer them the way you want. He answers them in a way which is right. So sometimes his answer is no. That's not the best thing. But I want a milkshake. You can't have one. I want to drive a Rolls Royce. You can't have one. I want, and God often says no. If God answered every prayer straight away, we'd soon become spoiled. We'd click our fingers and expect God to jump. So sometimes he says, no, that's not best. Sometimes he says, wait. I will answer it, but not now, because it's not the best time. Maybe in a few days, or a few months, or a few years. Often God says, wait and trust me. And sometimes he says, yes, and our prayers are answered straight away. So we can say, thank you to God for our answered prayers prayers. We can say thank you to God for people who share. 
people who share. Hey, life would be really horrible if people weren't kind to us and share things with us. Someone might share their car and give you a lift somewhere. Someone might share some of their family's clothes that they're not using anymore. They've outgrown them. But rather than throw them away, hey, you could have them. And in our family, I'm sure in your family, we've all more clothes that people have given us and we've done very well out of it. People share love towards us. Friendship, kindness. People are always sharing in lots of ways. So it's good to be thankful. Thankful. And then here's the last thing. Hey, thank you for Jesus. We should never get tired of thanking God for Jesus. And just in case we forget, God sent us a photograph. And it's there on the table. There you go. You might say, it doesn't much look like a person. It doesn't much look like Jesus. Uh, well, it, it depends what you mean. Jesus had a body, something solid, so God left us some bread. And Jesus said, people will take my body like I'm taking this bread and they're going to tear it apart. They're going to hurt me. And wine, of course, is red. And when you break somebody's body, often they bleed. So when Jesus poured out the wine, he said, that's my blood. Not really. I mean, he said, I am the door, but he didn't mean it was a piece of wood. He meant it's to remind you, like a photograph reminds you of someone you know. Bread and wine is there to remind us of Jesus' love for us. And so in a few minutes as Christians, we're going to take bread and we're going to drink some wine to remember that God loved us so much. He gave his one and only son to die for us. Now, before we give thanks for the bread and wine, we're going to listen to a song. And uh, you might want to close your eyes, but let's just reflect on God's love for us. And if we haven't said thank you to him already this morning, here's an opportunity to do that. So let's say, sing together or watch the song.
Do I need to stand here, Dave, or can I go down? Thank you. What can I say? Actually, you only need those two words if you mean them. Thank you. It's all God wants. Grateful hearts responding to his love. Let's give thanks, shall we, for the bread. Lord, we remember that you are a God of love. You know all things. You know our hearts this morning. Thank you that we don't have to play games with you. We can't fool you. We can't kid you. We just come, Lord, with all our faults and our failings. And Lord, we say, thank you that you are a God of grace and mercy. You do not treat us as our sins deserve. You give forgiveness, whereas we deserve judgment. But Lord, we know that someone faced that judgment on our behalf. Someone bore those sins. They didn't just evaporate. A price was paid. And in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for his love and his sacrifice and the power of his body and his shed blood. And as we take this bread now, as Jesus asked us to do, Lord, we simply say, thank you. Amen. Alistair, if you're happy to take it round, thank you. When you have the bread, feel free to eat it straight away and then we'll drink the cup at the same time. You're able to take the second layer off, ready to drink the wine. Let's pray again, shall we? Lord, thank you this morning that with believers all around the world, we are able to take communion, to break bread as Jesus commanded us to do. So ever, uh, we people in, in, in around the world are, are saying thank you in their own tongue. Lord, we are able to say it in English. Uh, but Lord, as we've reminded our hearts more than words, it's the gratitude of our hearts. Thank you that we can say this morning, the Son of God loved me. Not just everyone else, he loved me. And he gave himself for me. And so we drink this cup and we say, thank you. Amen. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Amen. Well, we're going to have our Bible reading, and then the youngsters are going off to explore us. So, Acts and chapter 4 is our Bible reading. We'll be on the screen, and as has been tradition, can I encourage you to stand for the reading if you're able to, and then we'll read a verse each. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. I'll read the first verse. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people. 
and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. Now, but my turn. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. And put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Well, we trust God will bless his word to us. Explorers, we're going to wave you goodbye. You're going up to your group now and we'll see you in a bit. Good, let's pray for them. Let's just pray for ourselves. Lord, thank you for each and every person in the building today. Thank you that we're here to feed our souls, not just fill our heads with information. So we ask that might be the experience from the littlest to the most senior. Lord, uh, spiritually, Lord, impact us by your word and give us the enabling of the Holy Spirit to put into practice the truths that uh, you speak into our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praying and sharing. Praying and sharing is our title. Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 37. Well, we've had uh, one little quiz for the youngsters. I thought I'd give you another little quiz for you lot. Okay? Just by way of introduction. And uh, a bit of name trivia. Collective groups, a bit of name trivia. No pictures, just questions. The collective, and you can just shout it out if you know the answer. The collective name for a group of foxes is? The collective name for a group of foxes. It's a charm, a charm. There you go, you've learned something today. The collective name for a group of owls. A parliament. A parliament of owls. The collective name for a group of butterflies. It's a kaleidoscope. I love that. A kaleidoscope. Have you ever used a kaleidoscope? All those colours together. The collective name for a group of hedgehogs. Close, close. 
prickle. A prickle. Collective name for a group of tortoises. It's not too far off slow. A creep. A creep. The collective name for a group of sharks. Close. A shiver. A shiver. I'm not making these up. These are genuine. The collective name for a swarm of ladybugs. Ladybugs, ladybirds. Collective name? A loveliness. Isn't that a good one? A loveliness. And then my favourite one, a collective name for a group of crows. It's a murder. A murder. And the reason is because in the past, before gunpowder was invented, a group of crows were used as a signal for the ambush if you were trying to trap someone or harm someone or kill someone. Well, here's the, the link. A collective name for a group of Christians from the verses we've read. You can only use the verses we've read. I've got at least six. Family, body, fellowship, flock, assembly, congregation, church. But there are four in the passage there. Believers, prayers, attenders, and sharers. Those are the four words that were told these people did when they came together. They were believers, they prayed, they came together, they attended, and they shared. The passage actually divides into two parts. The first part, verses 23 to 31, praying. And then verses 32 to 37, sharing. So you've got two mini-sermons in one. Praying and then sharing. So we're going to look at it in those two bits. Don't worry, the first bit I've got five points and the second bit I've got two points. But we are going to zoom through it. You'll be home for tea tonight. And don't forget tonight we've got our evening Zoom prayer meeting. And uh, hopefully this will encourage you to be there. Now as you read through the book of Acts... One thing the early church was, was a praying community, a praying body of people. In fact, prayer is mentioned over 30 times in the book of Acts. But we all know it's so easy to talk about prayer than it is to actually pray. There's a well-known quotation that says, an ounce of practice is generally worth more than a ton of theory. And as a preacher, the theory bit is easy. We all know we ought to pray and how to pray and which ways to pray. It's the getting down, doing it. That is always the challenge and the hard bit. We were on a conference uh, just over a week ago. And one chap in my group said, my church has 700 members, but our prayer meeting has 12 people. And if 12 turn up, we are doing good. Shameful, really. Shameful. Too many of us are slow to learn that the early church was serious about praying together. And this first section gives us five things to do with prayer. Here's the first one. Notice who is praying, verses 23 and 24. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. On their release, Peter and John didn't go back to the other ten disciples or ten apostles and have a leaders' meeting. He went back to their own people, to the church, to their family, their spiritual family, their friends, their own. Praying is always something that ordinary Christians are able to do. Before I got married, I used to get a nice holiday in September, a working holiday, with the Christian company called Oak Hall. They take Christian groups over to Spain, Portugal, all over Europe, in fact, all over the world. And I used to go for two weeks as a speaker, which meant I had the whole day free. I just had to speak at night. So it was a kind of a working holiday. And then the wife and the kids came along and spoiled it all. It's a tough life. But I remember on one occasion, we were going out to Spain, we had 74 people on a double-decker coach going out to Spain. And because I was the guest speaker, just before we set off, the courier, the the team leader said, uh, uh, just before we go on the mic, Gordon, will you pray for us? Pray for a safe journey. So I did. And then when we made our first kind of meal stop, he said, Gordon, will you come and just give thanks for us? So I was praying two or three times in the first few hours. And whether he did it tongue-in-cheek 
or whether he did it because uh, he, he was curious, I don't know. But a guy came up to me, he said, excuse me, he said, uh, can I ask you a question? So I said, sure, what is it? He said, are you a professional prayer? <laughs> so I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you're the only one who ever prays on this trip. I think he meant it as a joke. But listen, there are no professional prayers. There is no gift of prayer. You know that. In the list of spiritual gifts, there's no spiritual gift of prayer. Anyone can pray. And these Christians proved that. They came together and they prayed together. Who is praying? The ordinary members of the church. And if we're going to be successful as a church, we need each and every one to support what goes on with prayer. Secondly, when it was prayed, verses 23 and 29. Notice when it was prayed, verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. The occasion it was prayed was in a period of opposition, difficulties, persecution by the religious leaders. In fact, in verse 18, they're commanded not to go and speak about Jesus. Yet as soon as they're released from the prison and the courtroom, they go out and they start talking about Jesus. When opposition comes into our lives, we have a choice. We either keep a low profile and blend into the shadows, or we carry on doing what we believe is right. These people were sent on a mission by Jesus to go into all the world, starting at Jerusalem, then Samaria, to the ends of the earth, and share the gospel. So they went by a higher authority than these religious leaders. But they knew that as a result of that, they would no doubt get rearrested, be on trial again, and maybe even end up in prison. When it was prayed, in a period of persecution. So when life gets tough, don't give up, look up. Don't give up, look up. Ask God for his wisdom and strength as to how you respond in that situation. Thirdly, notice who they prayed to. Verse 24 to 28. Notice as well, they take five verses to tell us who God is and two verses to ask God about something. So five verses telling us who God is, but only two verses with their requests and their petitions. They identify God in those five verses in two ways. First in verse 24, they praise God for the fact he is the creator of all things. Sovereign Lord, they said. You made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them. There's a story told about Sir Isaac Newton, who made an elaborate clockwork model of the solar system. And someone looked at it and said, boy, you're pretty clever. That is very impressive. And Newton replied, well, I am, but not as clever as God. He made the original. (laughs) And these Christians who are facing persecution remind ourselves that there is a greater power. They follow the creator of all things. There is no one bigger than God. And if they are on his business, he will watch over them and look after them. So they are focusing on the character and the attributes of God, reminding themselves they've got a big lump of opposition, but their God is bigger than any opposition. And they appeal to the creator of all things in heaven, earth, and sea. And then second in verse 27 to 28, they praise him because he alone is the ruler over all. And they quote Psalm 2, verses 25 and 26. A psalm where the psalmist experienced opposition and God gave him victory. It's a psalm that's prophetic, um, A reminder, it speaks of Jesus. It's a messianic psalm, a psalm about the Messiah. That Jesus too experienced opposition. Herod and Pilate gave the orders to crucify him. Both Jew and Gentile involved in the execution of Jesus. He looked dead and buried. They won. 
But we know the end of the story. Three days later, he rose again. He won. He won. And this verse reminds us of the old proverb, men may win the battle, God will always win the war. Men may win the battle, God will always win the war. And so this prayer is a reminder that, Lord, even though one or two of us will die, even though one or two will end up in prison, Lord, you're going to use this situation for your glory and the extension of your kingdom. You're going to win. So keep us trusting. Keep us trusting. And the prayer shows us, again, the importance of good theology and good doctrine. Good theology, good doctrine. In other words, what you believe will help you in difficult times. For example, verse 24, he talks about God as creator, the doctrine of creation. Verse 25, he quotes scripture, the inspired scriptures. Verse 28, God is sovereign. These truths, under, they were like a foundation to their prayers to give them confidence and belief and strength. So who they prayed to? A great God. A great God. Notice too what they asked, verse 29 to 30. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand and heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Well, in Jesus' name, they asked for two things. First, God would give them courage. Enable your servants to speak your word with boldness. Hey, when you face people who oppose you, I guarantee your knees will knock. You know, every preacher, every, anyone who witnesses, we're all like ducks. We might look confident on the top, but our little legs are going like that to stay afloat. Any confidence we have is in the word of God and the ability of God to speak in us and through us. We all need courage. If you've got courage, God can use you. And if you haven't got courage, pray God will give you courage. And then secondly, they pray God would do miraculous things. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders. And they tell us why they want God to answer their prayers with signs and wonders. So that Jesus will be vindicated. That means they will realize they did something to Jesus that was wrong. He was innocent, but they killed him. And again, the signs and the wonders are there as a springboard to glorifying Jesus and for evangelism, to win people to Christ. And then notice the fifthly, the results that followed. The results that followed. What happened next? After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I love that verse. I guess it's true today, I, I, you know, I've never been in my kind of 35 years as a Christian, I've never been in a building that has shaken as a result of the prayer meeting. I've been in a building that shook because there was an earthquake, but never as a result of prayer. I've been in uh, uh, many churches where you've shook people to wake them up at the end of a prayer meeting, <laughs> but that's something quite different, isn't it? In this very building, the, the, the building shook with the power of God. That tells me that's prayer. And the sort of prayer I only read about or dream about, but don't know. Jim Elliott was one of, it still is one of my missionary heroes. Uh, one of the five missionaries killed in the late 50s in the Kurai River in Ecuador. Five missionaries. Nate Saint, Roger Eurodian, Ed McCulley, Pete Fleming... And Jim Elliot speared to death as they tried to reach. In those days, they were called the Auka Indians. And one of the books on my shelf is called The Journals of Jim Elliot. If you've never read the story, go and get hold of Shadow of the Almighty. Brilliant book. You can actually see clips on YouTube. It's a fantastic story. But I've got the journals of Jim Elliot. He kept a diary. He was a disciplined man. And um, what a godly man he was. And I don't read it too often because I'm ashamed at the, the, the shallowness of my Christian life in comparison to the depth of his. But one entry that I've never forgot is this. He prays this, Lord, forgive me for being so ordinary 
while claiming to know an extraordinary God. Wow. Forgive me for being so ordinary while claiming to know an extraordinary God. Hey, we've got an extraordinary God. We should expect extraordinary things. No, I don't think you can put God in a box and expect him to do A, B, C because you commanded it. But I think when we pray, when we walk with the Lord, when we meet together as a church, God is at work. And he's going to do something. He's going to change lives. He's going to answer prayers. He's going to help us impact this community when we're together, when we're dependent, and when we're filled with his spirit. An extraordinary God. Please, Lord, do extraordinary things. And as we're Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit filled these people, it led them into evangelism. As they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly with confidence. They're not scared of the religious leaders. It's as if they're saying, come on, bring it on. So those are five things the Christians prayed. And then two things, just as we finish, about the Christians sharing. Things we've already covered in the book of Acts, they kind of repeat themselves, but they're worth noting. Uh, The American preacher and author John Piper writes these words. Two of the effects of believing in Jesus are that the heart is loosened in relationship to things and tightened in its relationship to people. It's a great quote, that. The effect of believing in Jesus is that the heart is loosened in relationship to things, possessions, objects, and tightened in its relationship to people. And you see that quotation outlived in verse 32. All the believers, hey, they're in relationship to one another. You believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. There's a bond, there's a glue there. They want to be together. And don't rush by the word believers. I like the translation that puts it this way. Now the company of those who believed. The company of those who believed. That's the key, the root of what's happening in this story. Everything good comes from that. They're loosening their love for possessions, things, objects and they are deepening their love for each other company good company friendship fellowship love for one another this is the family the body of christ there's not one over there and one over there and one over there they're together because they're family they're the body and what we have here is not a good idea of charitable people look we've got some stuff let's give the poor a hand out it's not that at all. It's what Jesus taught. You remember a guy came to Jesus in Matthew 22 and verse 44, and he said to Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? You know, we've got 10 of them. What's number one in your opinion? And Jesus doesn't quote an individual commandment. He summarizes them. The first four commandments are all to do with God, and the second six commandments are to do with living with other people. So Jesus summarizes them by saying, love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. First of all, get right with God. That's number one. And number two is like it, get right with other people. And that's what these people are doing here. They're right with God through Jesus and they look at and they see people in the need and they help that need because they want to be right with other people. And there are two effects because of their love for Jesus. First of all, there is unity, verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. We've got friends in the church that have just left. Now, I don't know all the circumstances, but it breaks your heart, or it should do, when people leave one church for another. Surely the Christian way is to resolve these things and talk them through and pray it through and and, and, and someone has to show a bit of humility, not just to pick up your toys and go somewhere else. No, I don't know all the circumstances. But in the book of Acts, I read one heart, one mind. If they're focused on Jesus, surely they're going to have one heart and one mind. I 
I read this online this week. In an American newspaper, someone was running for, um, uh, what's it, the, they wanted to be the commissioner. And so they took a vote on it. And the quote said this, that in, the, in anti-county commissioner, Tom Bagel, it's an apology, has, re- has 100% support for his family, not 10% as was stated in last week's article. <laughs> Can you imagine that? He's running for, 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 for a key position in government and the newspaper prints 10% of his family are behind him. <laughs> hey, there's not 10% of the Christians meeting together in this book, is there? Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter... All the way up to chapter 8. They're all together. Now, of course, not everyone was there. It's a general statement. But it's a reminder that God's not after 10% or 20%. He wants us all. We've all got something to contribute. When you're not there, we're missing out on your contribution. And when I'm not there, you're missing out on mine. And when we get to serve, we need your spiritual gifts as well as my spiritual gifts. We've all got something to put in the pot. So let's give them 100%, not 10%. Unity. And then finally, the second effect is sharing. Verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. And then we have the example of Joseph, a Levite, who actually sold a property and put that money in the pot. Now, this isn't communism or socialism or anything like that. It's simply looking, seeing a need, and meeting that need. Notice we are not commanded to do the same. You know, Jesus said to certain individuals, go give your money to the poor and follow me. But it was to an individual. He never said that to everyone. And he never taught it as a general commandment. If your money's in the way, Jesus says, get rid of it and follow me. But if your money's not in the way, then you can keep it and use it as you feel God would have you use it. And there's no command that Christians are to sell their properties and give what they have. Hey, if God puts that on your heart, that's a different story. But that's for you, not necessarily for everyone. But they saw a need, and they met the need. The story just came into my head of Tony Campolo. Tony Campolo, an American preacher and author, he said he was at a missionary meeting on one occasion, and someone passed him a note. He was on the stage preaching, and someone passed him a note saying, Dear Mr. Campolo, we've just had a prayer request from someone who needs to buy a truck out in some obscure village in in the middle of nowhere Uh, would you pray that God will provide for that person and Tony Campolo looked at the note and he said are you serious he said I'm not going to ask God he said there's enough of us here who can afford that truck let's just have an offering and send it to them and many of us would be scared to do that but it's a fact isn't it if we see a need and we can meet that need then you get on and do it Sure, you can pray about it, but you don't have to pray about it. Well, maybe, just as we conclude, we don't experience God's power. Maybe the walls aren't going to shake for us today because we've got it too easy. We've got God on our terms, and we like it like that. And certainly when we pray, we're reminding ourselves that we follow him on his terms. Lord, we need your power, your intervention, your filling We need you to change our desires and attitude to what we do and how we live. And if we get that, maybe we'll experience the Lord working in a fresh way. Let's link our hearts together in prayer again, shall we? Let's pray. Lord, these words are simplistic, and yet they come with a punch. Lord, if you've spoken to us on any particular issue or point, help us to ponder it and give us the desire to say, Lord, not my will be done but yours. So apply your word to each to every heart, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when I was thinking about praying, a kid's hymn came to mind, but uh, I couldn't find it anywhere on YouTube or whatever, but there's an old hymn by a man called John Burton about praying, and he says this, I think it's in Sankis. I'm not sure it's in Golden Bells. He said, I often say my prayers, but do I ever pray? And do the wishes of my heart go with the words I say? I may as well kneel down and worship gods of stone as offer to the living God a prayer of words alone. 
For words without the heart, the Lord will never hear, nor will he, help, nor will he to those lips attend whose prayers are not sincere. Lord, show me what I need and teach me how to pray. Nor let me ask thee for thy grace, not feeling what I say. It's a lovely old hymn. There's another old hymn we'll just listen to as we finish. We can get it up. <laughs> just as we conclude let's say a benediction together shall we shall we stand and share the words on the screen to the king of ages immortal invisible the only god be honor and glory forever and ever amen enjoy your day